Jan Brzezowski from the Priory of St. John the Baptist in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I'm very honored to be here today to give you an insight as to what it's like to go on a Templar pilgrimage. My husband and I have been on two pilgrimages, one in 2012 and one in 2013. And I'll bet I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking you would like to go, but you're a little nervous about your safety. Well, I was also had concerns. And I told my husband that since he wasn't nervous, maybe I could stay back and he could go. And he said, no, he said, if I wasn't coming, he wouldn't go. Well, I couldn't very well have him miss this wonderful opportunity. Here are the facts. Tourism is a very good part of Israel's economy. And it is very safe. They've never had a tourist get harmed. Plus, when you arrive in Tel Aviv, you're met by your Palestinian Christian guide, who is the same guide throughout your whole tour as long as well as the driver. And he is having your um, safety at the top of his priority. So once I met him, I felt totally at ease. And I can guarantee you will really enjoy yourself. You will. Now that just sounds, sounds a little bit like that men's warehouse commercial. <laughs> you will totally enjoy yourself. And I can guarantee it. Well, you know what? I can guarantee that you will really enjoy yourself. It is a trip of a lifetime. You'll renew your mind, your body, and your soul. Now some people ask me, about um, Israel and what the distances are and what all you see. Well, first of all, Israel is bordered by the Mediterranean Sea, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And when you fly in, you fly into Tel Aviv. And from Tel Aviv, you go down to Jerusalem. And that distance right there is about a 55-minute trip. And you will stay in Jerusalem for seven days. You will be seeing all the sites, Ramallah, Bethlehem, Jericho, which is the oldest city in the world and is a mile below sea level. And you have be staying at a very wonderful hotel the hotels give you breakfasts and dinners, and the food is delicious. So after you've been there for seven days, you drive up to the Sea of Galilee and stay in Tiberias. And that is about 162 miles. And then while you're there, you go to Cana, over to Arco, and I'll tell you all about that, and try to get you very enthusiastic and wanting to go. The weather is perfect in November, October, and November. The days are pleasantly warm without being too hot, and the nights are very comfortable. And your ladies, the ladies should wear, in order to go into the holy sites, should wear long slacks and have sleeves on their shirts. It could be this short or it could be long and should never wear sleeveless and not capris or shorts. And the same holds true for the gentlemen. If you want to go into the holy sites, that's what you wear. Now some women have asked me if you needed to have a shawl for your head. They've never, I've always had one with me, but they never um, require that you have it. But they do quite require that you are dressed appropriately or they will not let you go in. So no shorts, no capris. And one thing to remember is that you should really wear very comfortable shoes because you're walking on uneven steps, tricky cobblestones, wear shoes that are very sturdy. And in our group, we had, in 2012, we had three women and 10 men. And we stayed, like I told you, in Jerusalem for seven days in a beautiful hotel called the St. George. Now, in 2013, we stayed in another beautiful hotel called the Christmas Hotel. Um, so if you get either one, you'll be dutifully satisfied. 
and we went in, when you go to Tiberias, you stay in a hotel right on the Sea of Galilee. And don't forget your swimsuit because it's a wonderful opportunity to either go in the morning or to go in the evening and go into the Sea of Tiberias for a little swim. Now, a typical day would start with your breakfast in the hotel about 6.30 or 7. Then we boarded a very comfortable van about 8 o'clock to be dropped off with our guide by the holy sites. And there, like I told you, there's a lot of um, cobblestones and walking on uneven stairs, bending down to get into little openings. Um, so you should be able to handle all of that um, walking if you're going to go. And remember, this is a pilgrimage. It is not a vacation. You're not sitting on a beach in Florida reading a book. But you'll be very glad that you did go. The day ended about 4 or 5 o'clock. And then we had dinner about 6.30. And the, don't forget the dinners and breakfasts are included. Now you might ask yourself, well, what did you do for lunch during the day? Well, we had... Um, uh, typical little cafe lunch on the way if we didn't have a lot of, of time and you would stop off at these little side cafes on, in these little markets and you would have Israel's fast food which would be a shawarma or a falafel and a shawarma is um, uh, one that is wrapped in pita bread with vegetables, but you will have the meat in there, either lamb or chicken. And a falafel just has the vegetables wrapped in the pita bread. But if there is time, um, and you do have uh, the opportunity to stop at a restaurant, our favorite restaurant was called The Grotto, and it was built into a mountainside. You walk down these stone stairs into this stone building, and when you first got in and you looked at the panoramic view, it was unbelievable. You were looking at the other side of another set of series of mountains, and on the ceiling um, was a canvas, and it was supposed to look like you're in a tent in the mountains. Hmm. And they had, um, in the corner, they had a stone fireplace that they um, were grilling the lamb or the chicken. And then your typical meal would come what they call salads. And salads would be on little bowls about this big, maybe four or five of them for four people. Um, and you would all share that. And it would have hummus on one, pita bread ripped apart on another one, spiced carrots and peas or creamed corn. And then you would spread that on and that would be your salad. And at this particular restaurant, we were served lamb. And the lamb was just delicious. It, it actually was kind of like in a little ball, um, like almost like a little meatball, but it was a lamb meatball. And grilled to perfection, and they had little, very delicious little potatoes with that as well. And we all enjoyed ourselves. That is one of the things that people always ask, how is the food? The food is delicious. You know, our pilgrimage followed Jesus' footsteps to 31 official sites, and it was truly a life-changing experience. We reaffirmed our baptism in the River Jordan, the same river that John the Baptist performed his baptisms. And when you get there, there are several groups from all over the world waiting to take their turn to go down the steps and reaffirm their baptisms. And some of them are from Kenya or Nigeria, and they are dressed in the very bright and colorful garb, and the ladies had the big turbans and the brightly colored dresses. Usually the whole group was the same. They all got the material, and the men and women dressed the same, and they had the most beautiful voices. And they would stand on the stairs waiting their turn, and they would sing hymns. Now you can imagine, you're going down to the River Jordan to reaffirm your baptism, and they are singing these hymns. It's, it's a very fantastic experience. Now we traveled from Jerusalem to Tiberias, which I told you was 152 miles, um, to stay at the Sea of Galilee. 
Don't forget what I said, pack your swimsuit because you don't want to miss a dip in the Sea of Galilee. Um, in one morning we sailed on a sh ship that was styled just like the boat, I should say not a ship, the boat that Peter used to go fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And when we all got on, and it's just our group that went on this boat, and when we all got onto this boat, the captain knew we were Americans, and as we sailed out, he had one of our um, people raise the American flag. So the American flag goes up, and then he played our national anthem, and we all sang. You know, here you are on the Sea of Galilee, and they are playing your national anthem, and you're singing. It just gives you goosebumps. And then a little later, he took out this big net, circular net, and he showed us how they used to fish. And he took that to the, went to the bow of the boat and took that net and flung it out. And, of course, he brought it back in, and he didn't have any fish. Probably he didn't have any fish because Jesus wasn't there to help him at that particular time. Anyway, that was, that was very interesting. And then we would sit and just contemplate as this boat quietly sailed on these calm waters and they would hit, play hymns like Amazing Grace. Yes, that was an amazing experience. Now, over there we went to Cana of Galilee where Jesus performed his first miracle, which of course is changing water into wine at the wedding feast. And you had the opportunity to renew your wedding vows, and my husband and I did just that. It couldn't get any better than that. And we walked on Via del Rosa, which was the way of the cross. And it takes you through busy marketplaces, and you follow the stations of the cross. And at one point, there's a spot where there's a big rock, and it has an indent. And we all put our hands on there because... They say that's where Jesus stopped to rest. And then we made our way down into a cave where Pontius Pilate placed, lowered Jesus by a rope under his arms down into this stone cave. And when we got down there, you could see how cramped it was and how very dark it must have been at night and how lonely he felt. And there's a little opening at the very top and how he must have, you could imagine how he looked out and looked at the stars. And um, one of uh, the people from our party got up and read from the Bible that was sitting there and opened to a passage. And he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The list of fantastic sights is endless. Along the Mediterranean coast, we saw the ruins of a Roman theater where chariot races were held. And in that same area, we went to of Arco, there is a subterranean crusader fortress that they found. And it dates back thousands of years. And that's why I told you it was right up here at a place called Arco. And they are still to this day, by the way, still finding things after t digging away all the, the runes from each civilization and finding things. Now we walked into this subterranean crusader fortress and you walk down these real narrow hallways and probably that were lit by, um, you know, torches and into narrow passageways and bending down to get into some of these little areas. And then all of a sudden you'd bend down and you'd stand up and you would be into this great grand room where you can only imagine all these crusaders milling about, talking about their next adventure. And they were probably planning what they were going to do. But as you know, today our... Um, Christians are at risk around the world. And by the way, there's only 
when the first time we went, I think it was 2% Christians in Israel. Now we're down to 1.5% Christians in Israel. And we were very fortunate to visit some of the organizations that the Templars support. One of them is Bethlehem University in the Holy Land. And I'd like to make a quote that Cardinal Bishop Arch Timothy, Archbishop Timothy Dolan of New York said, every time I come here, I leave with the hope, the hope that radiates from the beautiful students. Thanks be to God for Bethlehem University. Now, one of the programs that we sponsor is an all-star hotel management program. And these students really need programs like this because they can actually get jobs. Since tourism is a big part of the economy, um, they are able to get a job. And while we were there, we actually sampled um, their hospitality and they set the table, which is a very big thing because most of those stu students do not know how to set tables. They learned how to set the table, how to prepare the food, um, and we sat down and ate with the students and, and um, learned that it's a very diversified group. And they're very happy that we do support the students. We also went to an Episcopal school that, was, that supported students that would never have the opportunity to go to school unless the Templars supported them. Another program was an orphanage called the Crush of Bethlehem. And it was started by the charity, the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul in 1883. Now the crash has infants and toddlers that were abandoned or given up by families um, that were too poor to have extra children in their household or women that were raped. Now when we walked in, the, we saw the toddlers at first and then we went no, we saw the, excuse me, we saw the infants at first, and then we saw the toddlers. And this little gal right here came walking up to me and had her hands raised and wanted to be lifted up. And at the time I thought, boy, if only I could take her home with me. But of course you can't. And the director came out and said, this is a good example of what um, they, they do. This little girl was found as an infant in a garbage can. And if they wouldn't have a place to bring them, these children would never survive. So she's doing well. It's a very remarkable place. It's clean, and this, the babies and, and uh, little toddlers are very well cared for. Then we went to another location and met Sister Maria. Now, Sister Maria came to the Holy Land 17 years ago and continues to help the poor. And she noticed that the families and their extended families all live in one room and how stressed they were because they're all living, sleeping, and eating in this one room. And she wanted to make their life better and their accommodations better. And she found electricians and carpenters who were willing to donate their time. And the Templars were donating the money for supplies. And she either gave them an indoor bathroom or added on a bedroom. And uh, it sure made their life much better. And uh, we made a huge difference in their lives. So many Christians at risk benefit from the Templars' support. And we benefit from going over there. When we went in 2012, I was invested into um, the Templars. And this church was in Jerusalem, and Pat Father Peter Vasco said at the end, he said, pilgrims come to the Holy Land to either be healed, to be touched, or to be guided. And as you, you, as pilgrims, will realize all are one sometime after you return home. And I think that is absolutely true in my case. 
I truly felt I was healed, touched, and guided. I hope this encourages you to go on a pilgrimage and please continue to support the Jerusalem might. Without that might, all these benefits that are happening to everyone over there would not take place. Please remember to pay your might. Remember, my mother always said, travel while you can, travel while you're able to. Don't put off until next year what you can do this year.